one that's pointed out a fairly ridiculous consequence of the uh, having 11 quizzes and dropping the lowest grade, so the 10 count, it is that Canvas is programmed to drop your lowest grade as you go along. So suppose you've gotten two perfect scores so far, two tens. It will say, well, we'll drop the second one. <laughs> OK, do not panic. Uh, next time, it will be counting the top two of the three, and then the next time, the top three of the four, et cetera. So that's kind of unfortunate. I would rather that it show the wall is counting until the end, but it's sort of giving you a tab of which one it would drop if, if the course were to end today. So anyway, that's weird. Do not panic. It will come back. You're not going to lose your score of a 10 or whatever it is. Uh, it's just an odd way of the feature of the way they program it. Uh, so anyway, uh, relax. It will work out in the end. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that a programmer thinks, oh, you know, counting n minus 1 and you know, thinking about just uh, dropping 1, um, gosh, those come to the same thing, but psychologically it's not the same thing. When you're looking at it, you see scores being blanked out with your drop. Any questions about that or anything else? There will be quiz 3. It'll be there by, by well, by the, it has to be there by the end of the afternoon. <laughs> Any questions? OK. Today we're going to be talking about essences. This is one of the key developments of Aristotelian philosophy, and it's one of those that um, still has a great importance in contemporary philosophy. So often, philosophers will distinguish um, essential properties from accidental properties. They'll talk about the essence of a certain thing. And those things, while unpopular at certain <laughs> stages, you might say, of philosophical development, both in the Enlightenment period and earlier in the 20th century, have now become part of the lingua franca that all philosophers use. So it's important to understand what an essence is. I'm going to back up a little and talk about Aristotelian metaphysics um, as it gets developed later in the medieval period, just because I want to make the point that there is a strong connection throughout this tradition between the structure of language and the structure of the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about Spanish and Latin American metaphysics, and specifically here about the work of Peter of Spain. Peter of Spain is a 13th century thinker. Nobody knows exactly who he is. Some people, in fact, for a long time, people were convinced this was the same person as Pope John the 21st, um, who had the great misfortune to move into the papal apartments, which were under construction at the time, and within a year of his assuming the papacy, had the ceiling fall down on him. And he died. Um, that might be who this is. <laughs> but contemporary scholars tend to think it's probably someone else, someone who was a friar and who just happened to share a name that was very similar to Pope John uh, the 21st. In any case, Peter of Spain wrote the most popular logic book in history. He wrote a book called the Tractatus, also later known as the Summulae Logicales, meaning the highest points of logic, a summary of logic. It went through 166 editions. It was the standard logic textbook from the 1200s all the way up through the 600s. 1600, sorry. So for 400 years, this is the book that dominated education in medieval universities. And logic was a required subject for everybody. So every university student in Europe basically studied from this book for 400 years. Now, that's a, itself a rather remarkable thing. By the way, I've a number of times, just for fun, read it in Latin. <laughs> You've got to have a weird conception of fun to think, hey, what will I do this summer? Just have fun. I know, I'll read the Tractatus in Latin. Um, I have been known to walk <laughs> from my house to Pep Boys on Route 183, reading Latin, uh, and nearly getting hit by cars as I did that. <laughs> in any event, he became a leading emblem of an approach to philosophy known as scholasticism. Now, in some people's minds, scholastic and scholasticism means something bad. It really means something that is like, well, philosophers standing around debating how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. <laughs> Abstruse, irrelevant conversation or debate about various issues that nobody really cares about. However, there's something about this method that I think survives in contemporary discourse that we take for granted. And so, admittedly, it can be pushed to an extreme. But there's something very important about this method. 
And it's still, I think, a really valuable tool of inquiry. Now, what is this method? Well, I describe it here as a method of dialectical reasoning. In other words, it has a lot in common with the kind of reasoning that you find in Platonic dialogues describing Socrates' questioning. But in this case, it has a much more formal structure. It has a much more explicit structure. So here's the idea. You're going to examine a question that other people have thought about. And so you articulate that question. Before you go do anything, you sort of say, all right, here's the question we're trying to answer. By the way, this is a great set of tips about writing in general. <laughs> Make it very clear at the outset what the question is that you're addressing that you're trying to answer. Then you survey various approaches to the issue. So you say, well, all right, here's the question. Now, what have people said in response to this question? Well, this person says this. That person says that. This one says something else again. And so you begin by looking at the main ways that people have used to try to answer the question. And then you try to figure out where they disagree. Presumably, these various approaches are going to agree on certain things. But to decide between them, you have to figure out where they disagree. What are the key issues on which they disagree? So identify those key points of disagreement. And then finally, use logic and the analysis of language to resolve the dispute. Now, ideally, the way you do this is you reconcile these views. You show how it is possible for highly intelligent people to have held these various views by showing what's right about them, where they actually agree. But then you try to show that the disagreement can be resolved by understanding the issue more profoundly. Now, notice here the controversial part is, in a sense, this use of logic and the analysis of language. For a lot of disputes and a lot of papers you might write, it's not really logic in the analysis of language. It might be an examination of scientific results. It might be further historical <coughs> inquiry, evaluation of new pieces of evidence, and so forth. But the idea is really you do things like this. You very clearly articulate a question. You consider various possible answers that have been given. You find out what are the key questions on which they disagree. They might disagree about all sorts of peripheral matters, but try to figure out what the fundamental disagreements are. And then try to figure out, on the basis of the things they do agree upon, how you might resolve that and answer the question. Well, I said this is a pretty good method in general. It was highly formalized in medieval universities, and often people conducted debates, disputations, they called them, based on this method where one person would defend one side of the question, another would defend another side, and it was up to the audience to try to do the reconciliation and figure out exactly how you ought to resolve the question. But it is a generally very good way of thinking about problems. Now, the Tractatus of Peter of Spain starts out with a bunch of books <laughs> devoted to what was called then the old logic of Aristotle. And don't worry about what that is, except to note the last one there, actually the last two, Aristotle's categories, and also the distinction between essential and accidental properties. So what we talked about last time, that categorical framework, and then what we're going to be talking about today, essences, that's really part of the foundation of thinking about all sorts of problems. So the point of putting this in is really not to sort of give you a crash course in medieval logic, but just to say that bit of Aristotelian metaphysics the question of what are the various kinds of being, and then what's the difference between an essential and an accidental property. Those are taken to be fundamental to understanding not just philosophical problems, but all sorts of problems. You have to be able to identify what the key issues are, what's really essential, and then what's fairly accidental, what's central and what's peripheral. So, you get trees like this. Uh, this is called the tree of porphyry, but it's something that is an embellishment. And actually, I referred to this a little bit last time. You could say, all right, substance. What is there in the world, according to Aristotle, substance? But then, what are the various kinds of substance? There are material or tangible substances. There are immaterial or intangible substances. And then among the material, there are bodies. Some are animate, some are inanimate. And then of the animate things, some are living, some are dead. <laughs> um, among the living, some are sensitive and others insensitive. In other words, some respond to their environments and some don't. Um, and among those sensitive ones are animals, which could be rational or irrational. And the rational ones are human beings. And then there are various individual human beings. So there's a sort of structure of kinds that is behind this general approach. Now, the rest of the book is about the new logic. 
And so this is a part where Peter of Spain gets creative and starts giving you a new theory that eventually becomes a theory of terms. But anyway, here is the key idea that I want to think about. To understand the structure of the world, we look at the structure of language to try to understand, <laughs> in other words, the nature of a problem, the nature of the world, what we do is we think about its logical structure. We examine the logical structure of language, and that tells us about the logical structure of the world. Now, it's not obvious that this is the right way to approach things. There's really a powerful philosophical thesis lying behind what Aristotle's doing and what these medieval thinkers are doing. Part of the reason I'm talking about it is that in the 20th century, analytic philosophy the kind of philosophers who have dominated discourse in all English-speaking countries hold to this too. Think that in order to understand the structure of the world, primarily you understand the logical structure of language. And so we can talk about Bertrand Russell or Ludwig Wittgenstein or Rudolf Carnap or W. B. Quine or a variety of other thinkers, all of whom adopt this approach in the contemporary scene. So, yeah, what are other alternatives to this? If you want to understand the structure of the world, what might you do other than examine the logical structure of language? What are other options? Yeah. Examine the structure of relationships. OK, good. That's a possibility. You could say um, Aristotle is giving us some kind of categories of the thing, kinds of thing in the world, maybe. And so we can think about the ways in which those relate. The structure of the world, you might say, is revealed by the nature of those relationships. And so that would be one way of approaching this. Now, you might think those relationships among things are revealed in language, or you might think they're not. They're a separate kind of thing you have to examine. What else could you do? Yeah? The structure of law. The structure of law. OK, yes, you could look at law. And do you have in mind like human law or physical laws, scientific laws? More like physical laws. Physical laws. OK, yeah. You could look at science, in other words. You could say it's the job of science to reveal the structure of the world. And so let's say you get to the university and you say, well, gosh, what should I major in? Hmm, I'm interested in the structure of the world. I'm interested in being man and the kinds of being and what the world's ultimately made of. Well, one person might say then study linguistics and logic and philosophy. But another sort of person might say study chemistry, study physics. Those are the people who investigate the ultimate constituents of the world. And so you might think that particle physicists, for example, or people who study hyperspace, are really the people who are identifying the ultimate structure of reality. So if that's what you care about, do physics. Don't do logic. <laughs> and so there is an alternative way of approaching this. Now, of course, if we don't have in mind that much uh, sort of theoretical science, you might still say, understand the structure of the world. Go and look at it. Right? Go and do an empirical examination. So we get knowledge of the world from perception. Go around and perceive a lot of things. See how they work. And so. It's not obvious that this is the best strategy. But nevertheless, it is the dominant strategy in the Aristotelian tradition. Well, in Peter, he says, in order to do this, we have to draw a distinction between simple expressions and complex expressions. In language, we articulate things in complicated ways sometimes. In fact, even a sentence, even a very simple sentence, is one that actually is built out of simpler components. So the, the first sentence that people would learn in 19th century readers was, the cat is on the mat. And that notice is a complex. The cat is on the mat. <laughs> Those various words are combined to form that sentence. Now, in your intro reading book, it was probably different. Mine was, <laughs> actually, this sounds bad now, C. Dick, <laughs> C. Dick Rub, C. Jane, C. Jane Rub. C spot, C spot, and that's the way the first page of my reader went back in the old days. I don't know what what is it now? When you were in first grade or something, how did you hear it? Okay, yeah. When when my kids were young, I, I homeschooled them and I taught them from these 19th century readers. And their favorite story in the first grade book was young boys should not drink <laughs> strong rye or whiskey. <laughs> Apparently, this was that day during the 19th century. Uh, well, anyway, so we've got complex expressions, and to understand them, you have to break them down into simple components. But the reason for that is really not just that the meaning of the complexes is built up from the meaning of the simples in systematic ways, a principle that linguists refer to as the principle of compositionality, but also that it's the simples that 
directly correlate with things in the world. And so look at these complexes and figure out what are the symbols. For example, the cat is on the mat. What has to be in the world for that to be true? There has to be a cat, right? There has to be a mat. The cat has to be on the mat. And so we are going to first break things down to these symbols and then figure out which of them correspond to things in reality. Well, Peter draws a distinction between things that are categorimatic. Those are the things that do refer to things in the world, like cat and mat, and the things that are sin categorized, the things that don't refer to specific items in the world, like the, or is, or on, in that particular sentence. So if we've got the cat is on the mat, cat and mat are categorized. All the other words are sin categorized. They are the symbols that just tell you how the structure is put together. They don't correspond to entities in the world. So our idea here is we take language, we break it down into simple components, we figure out which of them refer to things. And to find out what there is in the world, we see what we're really referring to when we talk. So the whole strategy here really is to say, what is there in the world? Well, what do people talk about? <laughs> when people discuss the world, what are the things they refer to? And that's the general strategy here. Break things down to simples, figure out which of the simples correspond to things in the world. Those are the categorimatic expressions and then say, aha, those are referring to things in the world. Here, cat and mat, what are they in Aristotle's terms? Substance, exactly. And so we're going to identify those words that stand for substances. Now, of course, some words stand for things of other categories, like on. What category would on correspond to? A cat is on the mat. Well, it's a preposition, and in Aristotle, would it be a substance, a quality, a quantity, a relation? Place. 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 Oh, all right, good. Yeah, I was thinking of on as reflecting a relation between the cat and the mat. But actually, you could also say there's a place thing going on. On the mat is a place, right? And so on itself, I think, is relational. But on the mat would be in the category of place. And so we could analyze both the simples and the complexes in terms of what they stand for in Aristotle's category or categorical scheme. So here's the general strategy. It's something that contemporary philosophers refer to as ontological commitment. What does our language commit us to? What has to exist in the world for what we say to be true? And the answer here is, well, look, analyze language to find these categorimatic terms, the ones that refer to things in the world, then see what they refer to. And Peter says, if you do this, it will confirm Aristotle's perspective. What do the things refer to? They refer to substances, and qualities of substance, and quantities of substance, and relations among substances, and times, and places, and actions, and affection, and states, and positions. OK. Now, that is really just to try to make explicit the strategy. Well, I'm, I go on and on about this, but enough, enough. <laughs> Here is a way of looking at this. We've got a term in language like cat or map, or here my example is triangle. And it means something. It connotes something. That is going to be an essence. It also refers to or denotes something, like a triangle in the world. That brown circle over there is supposed to be the world. And this blue circle is Daniel, that's me. It's a very abstract presentation of me. Okay, and suppose I say triangle, well that word has a meaning. We're going to identify that meaning with an essence, the thing that is essential to triangle, triangles. But then also, it might refer to a particular triangle, if I point to that thing on the brown circle and say triangle. And so we look at what these things refer to, and that becomes what is fundamental. Now, to understand what an essence actually is, and in these terms it will be what meanings are, what corresponds to various terms like triangle, cap, and map, and so on. We need to go back to what a substance is. A substance is the kind of thing that can admit contrary qualities. It can be solid one moment and liquid another, like a block of ice. It can be happy one day and then angry or sad the next day, like a human being. A substance can have different and contrary qualities at different times. OK, so things can change. Something can have one property, F, at one time, but then it can be not F at another time. It can be solid 
today and then liquid tomorrow. It could be happy today and unhappy tomorrow. How is that possible? Now, actually, I think in common sense terms, that doesn't seem weird at all. Things change. However, in the history of philosophy, this was a big problem. And we'll talk much more about it later. But here are a couple of extreme views about it. Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher before Socrates who said, yeah, you know, it's a puzzling thing. Look at this candle, which melts the wax solid before we light the candle. And then by the time the candle is run down, it is not solid anymore. Well, gosh, can the same wax be both solid and non-solid? Heraclitus said, that's a contradiction. You're trying to tell me the same thing is both solid and not solid? Ridiculous. So his answer, it can't be the same. Every change, everything that intuitively we would describe as a change, gives you a new object. So Heraclitus says, look, change is constant. And what that means is that really substances, if you want to talk about substances, last only for a moment. They only last as long as nothing is changing. But the moment anything changes, it's a new object. So yesterday you were happy, today you're unhappy, it's a new you. <laughs> You might say, but I'm the same person. Heraclitus says, no, you're not. Okay? In fact, his famous saying is you can't put your foot into the same river twice. Why? Because the river is constantly changing. There'll be different water. Okay? But also, you'll be changing. You will have your toe in the water, and then you'll take it out, and then you put it back in again. It's a new you. Look, I'm going to become a different person. Ha! Huh? New again! New again! New again! Okay, and the same thing is happening to the river and everything else constantly. Okay, well, why? Because, come on, I have my toe in and out of the water? Ridiculous. Either it's got to be in the water or out of the water for an object, or an object can't have contrary qualities. And the same thing is true of the wax of the ice cube and so forth. Now, Parmenides says, wait a minute, <laughs> you're telling me the wax was solid, but now it's not solid? That you were happy, but now you're unhappy? That's a contradiction. I refuse to believe it. So, <laughs> uh, he did, that's not really Greek, but, <laughs> but what he essentially says is, you say this object has changed, obviously that's impossible. Nothing ever changes. Now, things seem to change. He says they don't. It's all an illusion. So, you might think, now you're putting your foot in the river, now you're not. Don't believe it, it's an illusion. Okay, you are what you are. You are unchanging. We are all unchanging beings. There's a view of God that God is this eternal and unchanging thing. Harmony says everything is an eternal and unchanging thing. You are too. So is the river. So is the wax. Everything is just change is impossible. Why? Because if something changed, it would have a property and not have the property. Read it. Contrary. Now, you might think, wait. <laughs> There's got to be a better way of thinking about it. Rather than saying nothing lasts for longer than a moment, or saying change is impossible and it's just an illusion, isn't there another possibility? Well, Aristotle's answer is yes. There is another possibility. We can talk about some properties being essential to a thing and others as being merely accidental. This is a photograph of a candle factory in 1927, where presumably they knew a lot about wax and its essential properties. So. Here's the idea. A property is essential to a thing if, without it, that thing wouldn't be what it is. Essential properties are necessary to the thing. Okay? It has them by virtue of what it is. Now, those, not my, those are different ways that Aristotle puts this and that other people have put this idea. You might worry, are all those the same thing? It's a good worry to keep in mind. And by the end of today, I hope to <laughs> get you to see that it's a substantive philosophical position that they are the same thing. But in any case, that's supposed to be the idea. So an essential property is necessary to a thing. Without it, it wouldn't be what it is. And it has that property by virtue of being what it is. Well, the opposite of that is in a way easier to understand. An accidental property is one that the thing could lose and still be what it is. These properties are contingent. The thing might have them, might not have. So consider me as an example. What are some examples of accidental properties of me? Things that I would still be me even if I didn't have that property. Yeah. Clothes. Clo okay, good. The clothes I'm wearing, right? I am wearing right now a green check shirt. 
but I could be wearing a different shirt, and it would still be me. Right? Suppose, suppose I were to show off my great physique and take off my shirt. <laughs> it would still be me, right? You wouldn't say, whoa, our professor took off his shirt, and then there was this other guy standing up there. <laughs> uh, it would still be me. And that tells you that wearing this particular shirt as opposed to some other, or not wearing a shirt at all, it's, that's an accidental property of me. What are some other accidental properties of me? Yeah. My arm. My arm? Yeah. Yeah, I, I value my arm a lot. <laughs> okay, I really don't want to lose it. But if I lost my arm through some horrible accident, would it no longer be me? You say, yeah, I used to know this guy, but, but then he lost his arm. Now, <laughs> I mean, you might say you become a different person because the accident had such a strong psychological effect on me or something. But you wouldn't think, really? Yeah, gosh. That, that, that's, you know. Well, <laughs> Stan Bonbeck used to be a professor in the philosophy department, but then he was in this accident, and now he's not. He's, you know, it's a different guy. <laughs> uh, that would be very weird. Other accidental properties of me. Yeah. A haircut, good. I hit my hair grows long. You know, when I was in college, my hair went halfway down my back. I was, you know, then I really did look like a sort of keyboard and bass player, <laughs> more than a philosopher. Uh, but then I cut my hair, and did it, it turn me into a different person? Well, no. Later, by the way, when we talk about personal identity, I'll show you a picture, my college graduation picture. You'll freak out. <laughs> uh, well, maybe you won't. I would have told you I've spoiled this problem. But, but anyway, yeah, that's something that I can, you know, I can let my hair grow, I can get it cut, still the same person. Now, what would be an example of an essential property of me? Something such that if I lost it, I really wouldn't be me anymore. Yeah. My brain. Ooh, yeah, take out my brain. Am I still me? Probably not, right? You might think my brain is essential to me. Now, you might not think so. It depends on your view about the nature of the soul and whether it's the same as the body or... Uh, so that, it's a complicated question, I don't mean to prejudge it, but at least that's a candidate for an answer. You might think that having my particular brain really is essential to me. If we did a brain transplant, uh, some philosophers have talked about this sort of possibility. Suppose we put two of you to sleep, and we have this new brain transplant technique, and we transplant your brains. Then who is you? Right? Suppose I swap bodies with you, in effect. That we put my brain in your body, and your brain in my body. Then you wake up, and how do we describe it? Do you wake up and say, whoa, I've got a different body? Or do you wake up and say, what are this other person's thoughts doing in my head? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not obvious, but you might think, anyway, the brain is essential to you. What are some other candidates for being an essential property to you? Say your personality. Like your uh, maybe your personality. Suppose I really do radically change my personality. <laughs> We could worry about that, whether I'm the same person. Uh, there's a famous case in psychology of a guy who was in an accident. Uh, a metal rod ended up going through his head and destroying part of his brain, but he lived. It was a railway accident. And he became very, very different. Before that, he was a very gentle, mild-mannered guy. After that, he became unbelievably foul-mouthed and, <laughs> and uh, very blunt and, and all of that. And it, 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 his personality changed rapidly. And it's not absurd to say, wow, he's a different person. Now, you might not think so. You might say, wait, he's still, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then look, here's his ID card, the same guy. But on the other hand, often I think with personality, we do think there's something fundamental about that. And if something changes your personality radically, maybe we do think you're a different person. Any other candidates for essential properties of a person? Yeah. Genetics. Ooh, genetics. Yeah, you might say my genetic makeup is essential to me. And a certain kind of genetic makeup you might think is essential to being a human being, period. But then maybe my specific one is tied to me. So we could talk about the essence of a kind of thing, the essence of a secondary substance, what is essential to being a human being. But then we can also talk about individual essence, what's essential to being me. And maybe my specific genetic makeup really is required to be me. Any other possibilities? Yeah. Uh, what about like your identity? Uh, no one would know who you are, but you know who you are. Would you really be someone? Is that like an essential property? Oh, all right, good. Yeah, you're, I, you know, other people's perceptions of you. Suppose they radically change. Do you become different? Um, this reminds me of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode where this girl starts striking out and doing very bad things. And it turns out it's 
nobody notices her in the high school. And so she just like starts becoming invisible. <laughs> it's like she's invisible, you know, because nobody pays attention to her. And then she becomes literally invisible, and then she starts doing all sorts of terrible things to her classmates who ignored her. And uh, well, anyway, Buffy manages to lo locate her in a school filled with invisible people who have been through this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how literally to take that sort of thing, but at least in that Buffy, Buffy verse, <laughs> that would be something where other people's opinions can change who you are. But anyway, all of these are, as you might guess, more controversial than the contingent ones. Easy to say wearing this particular shirt is contingent and accidental properties property of me, identifying essences is a lot harder. But the idea is that if we can understand essential properties, then we can say how it is that the wax stays the same, is the same wax even when it changes. The accidental properties can change without the thing changing what it is. But an essential property, if you lose that, then you do become a different thing. Okay, so what is the essence of X? If we look at Aristotle, we find different formulas for that. One is what it is to be that thing. In the translation we have it in the book, it often says what X is propter se, um, which means really by virtue of itself. The Greek is kathauto, and it just means by virtue of itself. So what you are by virtue of yourself is your essence. Also what you are by your very nature. That's another phrase that Aristotle uses in describing. And finally, what is expressed by a definition of them? So what is expressed by a definition of human being would be the essence of human being. What would be expressed by the essence of, or rather a definition of wax, would be the essence of wax. Well, those are different ways of describing this. Aristotle takes it that they are all describing the same thing. What it is to be you is the same as what you are by virtue of yourself, that's what you are by your very nature. That's what a definition of you, if it were possible to give one, would express. Now, oh, yeah, I've got to skip that. <laughs> so what is a substance? Is it the same as an essence? Are you the same as your essence? After all, you continue through time, so does the essence. So maybe you are your essence. But maybe we want to say, no, you are really the matter that makes you up, <coughs> or the form that you have, or some combination of these. Aristotle considers a bunch of possibilities here. And really, in the end, I think he doesn't make up his mind. He says there are certain things we want to be true of essences and true of substances. And some of these things give us some of those properties. Nothing gives us all of those properties. Um, the, one, <laughs> the one incomplete I took out in graduate school was a paper that was going to try to sort out all of what seems to be a series of contradictions in the book of the metaphysics where he talks about this and I never wrote it because I decided, yeah, I, didn't, <laughs> I couldn't see my way out of the contradictions. But there are, according to Aristotle, four causes, four explanations, four answers to a question why. And if we want to understand essences of things, it helps us to understand these because these are often part of the essence of a thing. So. Some of this is formal. It relies on the essence in the sense of definition. And so we could talk about the form of a thing. Suppose we're trying to define chair. Well, we could say, let's think about the cause of a chair in the sense of the form of it, like having a seat for one person. Well, I should, I should just say a seat, four legs, back. OK, that would be something that talks about its form. We could talk about its matter. It's made out of matter, typically out of wood or plastic or metal. We could talk about efficient causes of this thing, the chain of events that led up to it. A chair is something produced. And then it's produced for a final cause, a purpose, a goal, in order for a person to sit on. And so we, in fact, when we were doing this, talked some about four, four things like having four legs in the back. We talked some about its purpose. It's for a person to sit on. It is an artifact. It's something made that has to do with efficient causes. And then it's made of certain materials that enable people to sit on. Well, I want to close by thinking about the way in which this thinking of essence gets developed in the medieval period, in the 13th century specifically, because it's going to lead to something we look at next week, a radical reconception of essence 
that takes place in the Enlightenment period. Thomas Aquinas talks about essences as causes, but draws a distinction between two kinds of essence, if you want to think of it that way. Two things that Aristotle identifies. And he says, look, these are really different definitions. Now, he doesn't depart that radically from Aristotle. In the end, he says, I think the same properties are picked out by these two ideas. That's the thing given up in the Enlightenment period. But nevertheless, the idea is they're really two separate definitions. One of them is, well, what the thing is in the sense of what its definition would express. He introduces a special Latin term for this, quiditas. And often it's just translated into English as quiddity, which is a hideous word. But it means whatness or what it is. Okay? Quid is just the Latin word for what. Quiditas, well, that's just a way of turning it into an abstract noun. So it's like whatness. <laughs> It's the what the thing is. But then the thing also has a nature. It's what makes it what it is. It is by virtue of which the thing is what it is. What makes something a cat? By virtue of what are the animals roaming around my house cats? That's due to their nature. On the other hand, what a definition of cat would be, that's something that is acquitted. What John Locke will later call a nominal essence. And so Aquinas says there are really two different things going on. The essence is, yes, the properties necessary to a thing without which it wouldn't be what it is. But then we've got these two ways of understanding that. One, what corresponds to its definition, but in the world. And then the other, what makes it what it is. One of those is its quiddity, its whatness. The other is what its actual nature is. So what is the essence of wax? Well, the properties necessary to being wax. Without these properties, wax wouldn't be wax. Okay, the quiddity is what corresponds to wax's definition in the world. It's, in other words, what we would talk about when we give a definition of the word wax. And the nature of wax is what makes wax what it is. Now, actually, if I ask you for a definition of wax, what would you say? What is wax? Like a metal, melted candle, yes. <laughs> That's one definition. What else could you say about wax? Yeah. It's made from petroleum. It's made from petroleum? Well, I don't know. I have some in my ear. <laughs> I don't think it was made from petroleum. Uh, but it can be. Um, what else could you say about wax? It's hard, right? It's hard to give these definitions, even in those terms, much less to say what makes wax what it is. That to our ears sounds like a scientific question. And so, here would be a way of thinking about this. The essence of wax is sort of a combination of two ways of approaching it. One would be a sort of common sensey definition of the term, like compound that's malleable near ambient temperatures. That's what you get if you actually look at um, <laughs> a dictionary definition. It's not a very good definition. I mean, it applies to Plato. Plato is wax. I mean, play, no, not. Plato philosophy. Uh, <laughs> and then the nature of wax is what makes wax what it is. It's a certain kind of organic compound. It consists of long alkyl chains. Okay? And those are two rather different ways of thinking about the essence of wax. Well, next week we're going to come back and we're going to see what that difference really amounts to. What happens if we take these apart and say there are very different approaches to the nature of the essence of the thing that we can take.